Uh, like I said, I'm Kevin Walsh from Southwest Research Institute. I'll be talking about the surface of Bennu as deduced from the tag sampling event that happened uh, October 2020. Uh-oh. So the first slide will show the um, press movie that was made to explain to the public what the tag event would be. And so here's our spacecraft approaching the surface of Bennu uh, to collect our sample. It's approaching at 10 centimeters per second, and it touches the 32 centimeter diameter annular sample head into the surface of the asteroid. After about a second of, of contact, it releases high pressure gas into the surface to fluidize the material and redirect it into the sample head and a few seconds later fly away. Now, uh, we did this in October of 2020, and we successfully sampled at Bennu. It was a great experience, and we're all very happy about that. The samples will be back in another year. Uh, but I want to talk about the, the actual moment of contact and the actual pressing of the sample head into the surface, because this is uh, a wonderful science experiment we got to do of interacting with the surface of a rubble pile asteroid, uh, which was uh, pretty exciting. And the first thing we see here is this is a picture taken a few seconds after contact. This doesn't look like the press image at all. That looked like a very gentle and not very exciting interaction. Here it's clear we liberated and ejected a huge amount of material and we really moved a lot of things around. So here's our chance to dig in a little bit deeper and try to understand what happened during the interaction and what it tells us about the surface of this asteroid. Do I need to direct this at? Thank you. So the sample head is 32, 32 centimeters across. Uh, the arrows are showing us where the, the gas is directed and redirecting particles through a mylar flap, getting captured in an annular ring around the outside of the container. Uh, the key for our experiment here, though, is that it's essentially a 32 centimeter cylinder being pressed down into the surface of a, a granular bed at 10 centimeters per second. There we go. And again, I just want to reiterate that this worked. This is an image we took of the sample head following the, the, the sampling attempt. Uh, particles are actually escaping from the sample head because the mylar flaps were held open by really large three and four centimeter particles that were jammed into the sample head. It was a good problem, still a problem because some particles escaped, but it was a good problem because the head was so full of material. And so the, the interaction here that I'm going to focus on is really about the one second, even a little bit less, before the gas was released into the surface. The strictly mechanical interaction, the momentum of the, of the spacecraft pressing this sample head into the surface. And so what we have here is a before and after set of images showing the surface just before contact, and then the next image is 1.2 seconds later, just after contact. And we've drawn a yellow envelope that highlights the, the primary region where we can see the changes in the surface. There's a little bit, of, a few things changing beyond, but this captures most of the changes. Uh, it's about, on average, 40 centimeter diameter around the external part of the head. So we, we mobilized quite a bit of material quite distant from the spot that we actually touched. For example, on the left, the far left extreme of the envelope, you can see we're levering a large particle that's about 40 or 50 centimeters across. So we're making contact and really communicating the forces uh, across the surface of the asteroid. You can also see on the far left and right around the, the sample head itself, we'll zoom in on this a little bit more, we lofted fine debris. The debris was essentially sub-resolution of the imaging, which is about one millimeter per pixel. So we're lofting very small particles. These were not cohesively bound to the surface, to each other, or to the boulders, and were able to be lofted under a really small force that was being applied um, in the end when we, we look at the measured forces. And so that is the experiment that we, that we did here. We take those images, those before and after images, to understand the timing of, of when we were making contact and so on. And then we look at the accelerations that were felt by the spacecraft during contact. And that is how I'm going to set up this experiment. How much force did the spacecraft measure during the, the, the time we were pressing the head into the surface? And what does that tell us about the properties of the surface? And so we're looking at the force profile as a function of time since some random time um, just before contact, the big spike on the right is produced from the gas release. That caused quite a bit of force that was felt by the spacecraft. And the actual contact and the, the beginning of penetration are the first two little bumps that we see 
around 49 and a half and 50 seconds. And so to make an experiment out of this, we really need an anchor point to know when the head was flush with the surface and started to be pressed into the surface. And so the, the pre-contact image of those two I was showing you before happened where that red line is on the left, just before 49 seconds. The post-contact image is the red line on the right, just after 50 seconds. They're 1.2 seconds apart. So we know on the right that we've already made contact, the head is flush, and it's actually starting to be pressed into the surface. So somewhere in here between those two is when we started the penetration into the surface. And if we look a little closer, and go next slide, I'm kind of hit or miss. There we go. If we zoom in on the sample head in that second image, the shadow's being cast over the lip of the sample head, but not up over the top of the sample head, help us understand that we were about two or three centimeters deep at the time of that second image. So now we have an anchor point for how far we had pressed our thing into the granular bed at a certain spot in time, and we can go back to that acceleration profile and integrate through it to understand the change in velocity and what that related to the amount of acceleration and the, the, the properties of the, the regolith bed. So what we deduce is that the, the first little bump at 49 and a half seconds, the head was actually being reoriented by contact with a, part, a, a large rock, and it was only fully flush and being pressed into the surface at the beginning of this blue box that I've outlined. Now if we integrate the forces felt through that time period up to where the gas pressure changes the, the experience substantially, we can get a, a measure of the depth over time, and that's what's plotted in the top panel, uh, with our anchor point where we thought we were about two or three centimeters deep, and we can find that we, we pressed the head about six or seven centimeters deep in the first 0.6 or 0.7 seconds of contact. And that relates to an incredibly small change in the velocity of the, of the spacecraft and the sampler head. And in effect, in this range that we've highlighted with the blue box, the maximum force felt there is only about 10 or 15 newtons of force. It was an incredibly uh, compliant surface. It was very, very weak. It barely pushed back at all. Uh, three minutes, please. So we could do the math on this, and that 10 or 15 newtons and the change in velocity felt and get a compressive strength for this top seven, six or seven centimeters of the surface, and it was only two to about 200 pascals. Can I get a slide? And we can take that peak force and the change in velocity that was felt and go back to some numerical models we ran in preparation for this event and deduce that there was essentially zero cohesion bonding the surface together, and beyond that, the surface had to be very minimally packed, had to have a very low packing fraction with more void space in the, the part of the surface that was interacted with than the bulk asteroid itself. Essentially, the near subsurface is half the density of Bennu itself. So there's twice as much void space as you'd find in the bulk asteroid. And so that's essentially our key finding from this, is that there was minimal or essentially zero cohesive bonding and very light packing in the near subsurface. And that explains the very violent reaction and the excavation of so much material. Slide. This uh, connects pretty well with the study of the crater that was formed. We were able to get a measure of the crater when we flew past the asteroid uh, many months after sampling. We looked at the, the, the spot of sampling on the surface. We were able to build another DTM of the post-sampling crater spot. And the crater is about nine meters across, about 70 centimeters deep. And the size and scale of that crater can really only be explained with the dynamics of that gas release if it was um, low density and very lightly packed as well. So two kind of orthogonal measures get the same result, that the, the, the upper surface of Bennu was very lightly packed. And so uh, I think I've run out of time, so I'll, I will skip through these. But uh, this leaves us with an interesting question. So that is our key finding, is that the near subsurface of Bennu is very lightly packed. Uh, essentially half as much as the bulk asteroid. But then we want to ask the question of why. Um, maybe we thought that fine grains would have cohesively bound to each other and to the large boulders and filled some of that void space, um, but we didn't find that. That could be due to the cohesive properties of those particles. It could be due to loss mechanisms that never give those particles a chance to, to stay near the surface. 
or those particles could be percolating into the subsurface because they're not cohesively bonding to each other or other boulders. Or it could be a lack of production of small particles and fine grains to fill that void space. Uh, there's a, part, a paper from Cambioni, Severio Cambioni, out recently suggesting that the relationship between fine particles on the surface and thermal inertia suggests that the boulders on Bennu are actually quite porous, and during long, uh, long timescale impacts of micrometeorites, that they compress as opposed to fracture and create significant fine grains. So those are two pathways to possibly explore going forward with different experiments. With that, I'll take some questions. Thanks. Uh, Dan Britt, University of Central Florida. When you say low density and near subsurface, how deep does the near, near subsurface go? Yeah, so we can speak to, I can speak to with, with my work about the top 10 or 20 centimeters. Okay, so. Uh, the, the Loretta paper, which looked at the crater, that crater was 70 centimeters deep. So we're getting closer to a meter there. Um, this fits, you know, there was a Shears paper that suggested that the outer layers of Bennu was lower density than the inside from gravity data. Yeah. But that's a, you know, those are much bigger length scales than what we're talking about here. So it's, it's not clear if they connect cleanly to where we could say 10 or 20 meters, but we, with the, these two papers, the Walsh and the Loretta papers that just came out, we could say a meter, I think. Okay. I do like the removal of small grains because it seems strange to me that you, that you're not going to produce lots of small grains from the under dense material the fact that you have a negative excursion in the coefficient of thermal expansion right at the uh, temperature range that this asteroid will go through all the time. And so you've got a lot of uh, structural stress on, the, uh, on the, uh, the mineral grains that will produce a lot of spalling. Yeah, th there's a, a little bit of suggestive evidence that there is increasing strength with depth, which might suggest a percolation effect. Yeah. The, in the Arakawa paper for SCI at Hayabusa 2, they suggest a little strength at depth, and Tarek Daly has a really nice cratering paper from Bennu that also suggests maybe some extra strength with depth. So maybe there's, you know, there could be a percolation effect too. Yeah. Hi, Steve Simon, University of New Mexico. I have a sort of a related question. Given the, given the constraint of like near, de, near zero density at the surface, and you know the bulk density, what would the core density at the center of Benno need to be to make to Oh, well, consistent. relating back to the question that Dan just asked, you know, we're really only looking at the upper meter here, so not a whole lot of the total mass of Bennu. Um, if we did connect this with the gravity data from Shears and we started talking about the tens of meters, uh, we would have to ask that question. But I think here this is such a thin layer on the surface that I don't think it would change the bulk density that much, or I don't think it would drive up that bulk density too much at the center. Well, what, would you, what would the estimate for the center of the core of Den Bennu be? So the Bennu's density is 1190 kilograms per meters cubed. Um, a couple different studies suggest different things for the macro porosity, the, vo the actual void space, the, the Beal et al. and Tricorino suggest about 15% void space throughout all of Bennu. So here we'd be doubling that and saying about 30% void space. Thank you.